on, big brother. I've met babies before. I expect meeting this one won't be any different. <gasps> Free. <laughs> of course, I could be wrong. Uh, oh my god, look at her big wings and her tiny little face. I just want to snuggle her so much. Oh my god! You know, after seeing the teaser footage, and after I'd been thoroughly tranquilized, I started thinking about the implications of Flurry Heart being born an alicorn, and then I did something very unwise. I looked into what the rest of the community thought of Flurry Heart, and I was pleasantly surprised. I thoroughly expected more fan rage about alicorns and Mary Sue's and ruining Faust's vision and blah, blah, blah. And while there was some of that, the majority of reactions have been very ambivalent. My guess is that two seasons of an alicorn being the central main character and the existing alicorn shown to be ineffectual at best and unstable at worst has softened a lot of the community reaction to new princesses. Had Flurry Heart been introduced around season two or season three, I suspect it would have been a bloodbath. But why does it have to be an alicorn? Why can't it just be a regular unicorn? Well... Why not an alicorn, Billy? Because alicorns are supposed to be special, and if you make alicorns more common, it makes them less special. So? Who cares if they're made less special? It doesn't change anything about the existing alicorns in any way, it just makes them more common. But alicorns are supposed to be this mysterious, godlike race of beings! We don't know anything about them that they control the sun and the moon! Billy, that's not actually how it works. Alicorns have never been mysterious or godlike in any way. Alicorns being mysterious is another instance of the community projecting onto characters, albeit in a far different way. No information has ever been given that alicorns are this mysterious godlike race of super beings. The closest thing to that is the fact that Celestia and Luna raise the sun and the moon. However, in Hearth's Warming Eve, it was shown that simple unicorns could do this as well. Beyond that, alicorns have never showcased any spectacular power anywhere else in the show. Their magic is strong, sure, but they don't seem to be able to stand up to much. The only thing that makes them special is their scarcity. I've been down this road before. Jedi and Sith got the exact same treatment as the Star Wars franchise progressed. We all know the whole story, don't we? In the original trilogy, Jedi were rare, mostly because they were slaughtered to extinction during the Clone Wars. There was Luke, and that's about it. As such, people made the assumption that being a Jedi was this really special thing that only the most perfect special snowflake could get to be. But what happened soon after? The prequel trilogy came out, showing that the Jedi were very abundant. The Old Republic series came out and showed the very same thing with the Sith Empire, where previously we'd seen only two at a time. And then the perceived invulnerability of both Jedi and Sith was challenged again and again. And while The Force Awakens is trying to put this being Force-sensitive makes you special aspect back into the series, Bioware's Old Republic MMO seems to be continuing the KOTOR 2 trend of marking both Jedi and Sith as being merely an elite fighter. Certainly powerful, but not invulnerable and can certainly be taken down by a knowledgeable trooper or Imperial agent. Jedi went from being essentially a Jesus metaphor to a higher up in the military. Powerful and respected, yes, but gods? No. See also, Keyblade Wielders. But then, why do people complain about it? It's hard to say, Billy, but if I'm being completely honest, I think it stems from the fact that the vast majority of pop culture is centered around the Messiah Complex. The what? The Messiah Complex. Basically, everyone believes they're the hero in their own personal story, and pop culture reflects that. Feeling like a special snowflake is a very dominant aspect in entertainment culture. Movies, television, and books have long centered around a main character being exceptionally special in some way that makes them perfect to save the world. The hero's journey as a trope is entirely this. Video games have abused this trope even further to the detriment of its industry and its audience. This is the root cause of people in, say, World of Warcraft objecting to more difficulty settings added to the endgame raids. Because if everybody has purple gear, purple gear becomes less special, and by proxy, so do you. It's also why tired tropes like the chosen one continue to be trotted out by lazy writers. Coincidentally, this is also why stories that use the everyman as a main character also have said everyman turn out to be the most special perfect person ever, rather than the cannon fodder you'd expect them to be. Honestly, I don't like the trope. I find it to be the most boring way to write anything. I like that the Sith are numerous. I don't like Darth Bane's rule of two. I like that the Keyblade wielders are more common than originally shown. I like that alicorns have some degree of numbers to them. In fact, I think the Sith comparison is rather apt here. What do you mean? 
Well, it's clear that Alicorns are not as powerful as we originally built them up to be. Their power has its limits, and while they're certainly stronger than most ponies, they aren't one mare armies. Much like the Sith and the Jedi, their powers have limits, and you could theoretically take one out if you knew how to exploit those limits. Bear in mind, there is a difference between reasonable limits and inconsistency. I still don't like the fact that somebody like Starlight was able to outfight and outmaneuver Twilight. She's doing nothing that Tyrek couldn't do but better. That's a clear fault in the writing giving Starlight plot armor because we have to have a non-violent resolution. But in general, Alicorns being just a few notches above the most powerful unicorns, I'm totally on board with that. Celestia's School for Gifted Unicorns being a school that secretly examines unicorns that have the potential to possibly become Alicorns, totally on board with that. I think de-emphasizing the importance of an individual Alicorn is an important step in the storytelling. It would certainly make things like Celestia constantly getting her ass kicked less of an infuriating plot device. But Lord Faust said that there should only be two Alicorns, Princess Celestia and Princess Luna! Well, hooray for Lauren Faust. Her opinion doesn't count for much. But she's the creator! She left! Lauren Faust was not fired from DHX. She left of her own volition. So her opinions on what should be going on within the show carry about as much weight and value as your average DeviantArt rant journal. I'm sure she had a lot of things in mind about what should be going on, but I can bet that the higher-ups at Hasbro would have disagreed. And this is what makes Faust a different creature entirely to, say, Megan McCarthy. It's no secret that Faust objected to a lot of your typical toy show marketing. She objected to more princesses. She objected to things like Equestria Girls. She likely would have objected to Twilight getting a castle. That's what she's known for, hating marketing, digging her feet in, and stubbornly resisting her bosses. Now, McCarthy didn't say no to any of that. She brought in more princesses, she brought in the castle, she wrote the Equestria Girls movies, and every single one of those were pretty damn good. A Canterlot Wedding is one of the most beloved episodes of the series. Rainbow Rocks is considered one of the high points of the franchise, and even the other two were pretty fun movies. And Twilight's Kingdom was pretty fucking awesome either way. So here's an obvious question. Which is the better creator? The one who takes her ball and goes home when she doesn't get her way, or the one who can take literally any idea and produce gold out of it? So personally, when the discussion of Alicorns comes up, I don't think what Ms. Faust wanted should be considered with any sort of regard. Maybe if she was still on staff, but even then, Hasbro could veto any of her decisions. Pulling out Faust's vision is how cowards walk away from an argument they're losing, because they lack the conviction or ability or both to properly defend their position, and rather than just nut up and take the loss like somebody with an ounce of dignity might do, they whip out some meaningless quote from Faust and start pretending like she didn't leave the series in the middle of season 2. And even if what she wanted did carry any weight, the reality of the series' progression contradicts her. Twilight became an alicorn, and while there was some tantrum throwing and nonsensical claims of executive meddling, general consensus two years later is that she was one of the best things in the series. The world didn't end, and her character wasn't ruined in any way. Some people act like adding new alicorns is going to ruin the series, but that's never actually been the case. We've built up in our minds this idea that alicorns are these super amazing special people when everything in the series has contradicted that. Twilight's power has almost universally come from her pursuit of knowledge, but the other three princesses have shown to be negligent at best, reckless at worst, and incompetent in between. And what's deliciously ironic about all this is that bronies have been craving more insight into alicorns as a species, but we all know that we're not going to get that unless they add more alicorns, because DHX has so far stubbornly refused to do anything with the alicorns they already have. And now that I said that, next season we're going to get a Celestia episode, aren't we? Yup!